Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Um, we're going to continue studying uh, Abimelech and Jotham, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful uh, for the time that we have this morning to once again open your word and to receive light for our feet. We are thankful, Lord, for the people that have continued to watch these videos and participate in these studies. We just ask, Lord, that you can bless them. We ask that your angels can watch over each person and the things that they are doing uh, with Iran as he's flying. And uh, uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, that we can contemplate these things that we are studying and that we can uh, obey your voice. We pray for the camp meeting, for the people planning to go. We ask that your Holy Spirit uh, can work upon the hearts of those whose decisions affect uh, whether somebody can come or not with visas and so forth. And Lord, we ask that um, we can understand these things, and that we can share them with others, and that they can have an impact upon our lives. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. And uh, <coughs> what you see on your screen, of course, is uh, this diagram that puts Jotham and Abimelech's line together. And we're going to try to, uh, so yesterday we put out these dates on Jotham's line that period of seven years. And I added a little bit here, um, just with the December 21st, 2012, I put the failed my prediction. And in 2014, I put June 22nd and October 22nd. So June 22nd is um, the first camp meeting that they have in Arkansas after they had established the School of the Prophets. Uh, and that's gonna be at Lambert Church. And then October 22nd, that's going to be uh, the fall uh, camp meeting. That's the one where I'm there. In the June 22nd one, that's going to be where um, <clears throat> Noel presents um, <clears throat> Ezra 7-9 and uh, marking that August 15th, 1844 is the midnight cry, the first day of the fifth month. Now, I, I had done that calculation back on August 31st, uh, 2013, um, but it's going to be presented to the movement. Noel is going to do that separately and illustrate it very clearly. <clears throat> so I'd added that uh, to, these, to this line here. Now, we had also uh, addressed just at the end of the study yesterday, we looked at the word there, uh, Gerizim, right? So we had looked at Gerizim. So Mount Gerizim, that's where Jotham is going to present. And that is the Mount of Blessing. And it's based on the root word Garatz, which only shows up in Psalms 31, 22. Um, it's the Hebrew number 1629. So we know that <clears throat> that's the number that Adilio uh, had presented on February 12th, uh, 2022. And uh, so there is, I'm just trying to remember um, what else there was. <clears throat> oh, and that was in Judges 9, verse 7, right? So we're, we're taking that as September 7th. Um, which is going to lead us uh, to Jeff's uh, presentation on September 7th, and that's going to be 329 days from October 13th, 2018, so September 7th, 2019. <clears throat> so all of these different symbols here um, 
we need to be able to place them on a line and illustrate what, what this line is about. <clears throat> how, how we can take this story of Jotham and how we can place it there. Now, we don't have uh, September 7th on the line uh, as an individual waymark. Instead, we've marked it here. So I'm going to go back here. <clears throat> Um, we've marked it here, October 13th to September 7th. So October 13th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019. And so this 329 days, <clears throat> um, and then we're going to have, so 9 verse 7 is, is that verse that we're looking at. So judges, the space there. Now, but that's just one one of the waymarks. Now, this waymark we haven't we we've marked them out one two three four five six seven, but technically this would be the empowerment of the second angel's message. So you know we probably should have uh, all those different things, the arrival, but we, we we can remember them, right? So it just would take up a bit more space to do that. So we know that we have a period of darkness and we have a message that addresses that. We have an increase of knowledge. Then we have a formalization of that message and then we have an empowerment. And if we, if we go back to this first part of this line, so I'm going to do this up here. So, so we'll keep that line the way it is. We have this continuous line, but <clears throat> we have to also look at this line here. So it's probably best to put all the details here in this line. So you have this, this message based upon this darkness, and we're saying that this message has to relate to Parminder's time setting, which is a false covenant. And that covenant is a covenant made with uh, the Protestant understanding. It's something that the, the church, it's inherited from the church, this Protestant way of studying. And we're saying that uh, Parminder is in the way that he came about with his prediction of the Sunday law back in 2012 is false that is we one is we can't do time setting in that in that manner right and so his his whole premise is false and and he's not going to expose everything about his methodology until we move through this movement once we get to 2019 we start to understand that this is dispensationalism it is the basis of Pro Protestant futurism. And, and Jeff had been fighting against time setting, these applications of time periods into the future where people would take the three and a half years or the 1335, or they'd take uh, the, the trumpets and they'd put them into the future and add time to them. And I had as well. So in my personal experience, when I was first an Adventist, um, back in, I guess it would be 1985, there was Adventists who were believing in the 1987 Jubilee, and there used to be this broadsheet, and I wish I still had it, but it um, got uh, lost along the way, and I haven't been able to find a copy of it online or anything. I do have one of the books, uh, not here though, uh, my nephew has them, but anyway, there was this time setting that was going on <clears throat> in, in the mid eighties. And, you know, they were using the Jubilee cycle. And, and when the 1987 Jubilee failed, they, they reset a date to 1994, right? So then you had seven years later, you know, the 1994 Jubilee. I mean, so the fact uh, is I looked into all this time setting. I've read everything on the spirit of prophecy about time setting because I had friends studying these things. 
a, one of them is a pastor now. And um, he was spending like eight hours a day for a number of months um, <clears throat> studying this. He eventually abandoned it. Um, but so I'm very familiar with time setting. And, and also when I started studying chronology, I mean, one of the things you see in that why people are motivated in studying chronology is their time setters. And so many different systems and schemes where people would predict, you know, that Christ was going to come or the secret rapture was going to happen, all these different types of things. So Parminder is involved in that darkness <clears throat> and he introduces it to the movement. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have um, a message that comes to this movement through chronology that counteracts what Parminder is doing. Now, it's one thing to say, well, Ellen White says that there's no time. But the reality is that our movement has time attached to it. So the very first thing that we would know is that Ellen White says there's no reckoning of the prophetic periods after 1844, but we're involved in a movement where we mark a prophetic mirror, the 2520 prophetic mirror, that ends in 1863. And then we also, prior to Parminder, we had also marked the 126 years from 1863 to 1989. And so we had time in the movement, that is, time does exist, but not in the way that Ellen White warned us against, that is, setting of dates. We didn't, we didn't have that in our movement until Parminder uh, introduced that. And Jeff correctly marked that as fanaticism. So then, <clears throat> um, you know, I've come into the movement in 2010, um, and I begin studying and just trying to understand the 2520. And in, uh, at the end of 2012, I understand this prophetic mirror. I begin sharing it at this uh, weekend camp meeting we had that started on October 5th. And um, actually, technically, I think it started the day before, but I first present on October 5th. Uh, then, so we started the evening before. And um, I start presenting line upon line. But I'm also presenting to individuals at this camp meeting, uh, this prophetic mirror. And, and one of the things about the prophetic mirror is the line upon line idea is that we're taking the line of Samaria and laying it over top of the line of Jerusalem, right? So that's one of the basis that we have of these lines that they're, that they're, we're setting upon a line, which is a line of, um, judgment and and then we have these way marks these um uh these plumb lines that are way marks of righteousness the plummet right so all of that is put into place in this period of time now we mark uh december 21st because that's part of this prophetic um near the 777 prophetic mirror and it starts with this failed prediction so if you think about the fact that parminder has has made a prediction his prediction is 2014 and he makes this pre prediction in 2012 that this line starts off with a failed prediction that's not one that parminder made uh you know it's based on the mayan calendar so it's not even really a christian end of the world scenario though some Christians do try to pick up on it, um, that the world's coming to an end and this Mayan calendar changing its date somehow is going to do that as if the Mayans had uh, were inspired by God in making their calendar. Obviously, we have all of these calendars and God bears witness to them prophetically because of the symbolism that's involved in them. So the Mayan calendar has this back tune of 144,000 days. And, and God uses these calendars uh, because they're measurements of time. But when you're when they make this prediction, 
um, it's not based upon God's word, right? And we can't know these things, but people try to do this all the time. So that's going to be 77 days act after October 5th. And so that becomes significant there. Now, so the message that arrives, right? We say a message arrives, that is, it's a time of the end. So a time of the end, you need a time period. And that time period is going to be the Mayan calendar time period. But this is counteracting false time setting, right? So we're going to see that this line begins with a failed prediction and it ends with a failed prediction. That is, Parminder's, he's going to have that 2014 date, but he's eventually going to present to this movement 2019. And 2019 is going to be a failed prediction, right? So if we're going to take this line, so we, we want to put things on this line, we're going to put all obvious, obviously these dates that we had on the other line, we're going to put them on this line here so that we can see it all. But how do we mark the time of the end in, uh, in Judges? What verses are we going to use that are going to bring us to December 21st, 2012. How can, how can we do this? I mean, we, we, we have a line, and, and we've been able to mark some of it already with verses from Judges. We have the darkness, so that darkness is going to be... Um, connected with uh, Abimelech, right? So Abimelech is going to hire these vain persons. They're going to take this 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth. Um, can we use any of this to mark the time of the end? Is there there's something here that we can use? Obviously, we start here with chapter 8 um, in this part with the death of, of Gideon. It's just going to mention these sons, right? The three score and ten sons. And it's also going to mention uh, Abimelech, right? So basically 71 sons, but the one illegitimate one. So what would we use here? I'm just thinking that uh, Abimelech, if he began as a uh, king, reign as a king in 1260 BC. Okay. Well, that would maybe be parallel to 1798, the end of the 1260. Okay. So, yeah. So we're going to have a time of the end, and that's going to be 1260 BC. So that was that was one of the I knew that was, there was another thing I was forgetting about. So here we're going to say uh, now when we look at this line, remember this is Jotham's line. This this isn't the line of Abimelech, right? And um, so in Joseph's uh, a Jotham's line, I mean we have a time of the end, but this is prior to Abimelech being made king, that is, um, we have Abimelech's line, and Abimelech's line is going to start at the time of the end as well, right? So they're not necessarily the same times of the end, and and we would probably make this, this one here, I'm going to do this differently, I'm going to just take a separate box. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here I would take um, 1260 BC and 
And that's going to be Abimelech being made king. Right? I'm spelling that wrong. Yeah. Is that how you spell it? Abimelech? I guess I spelled it right. Okay. <clears throat> now, we would take the verse that I would use, um, just where in uh, Abimelech is introduced is 831. Now, why am I using 831? Uh, uh, why, why would I? I mean, that's the verse where he's introduced. So that's where we first hear of him. So I'm just going to put that there, 831. So why am I why am I marking that verse? What's the signif significance there? Okay, so Angela asks, could the symbolic plants listed by Jotham in an ironic sense be failed predictions that were selected as representing events, time setters expected to occur on certain dates? Okay, well, that's not the application we made. Um, we did have a 3-1 combination. We looked at these as, as messages. Um, but yeah, it might be connected. Okay, so we have 831. Now, in Abimelech's downfall, we have, um, we're saying this is 777 days. So the date that we're marking there is November 9th. Right, so that's the, uh, the date. So we need to mark that. So we get November nine. Oh, I'll this way. So that's going to be our time of the end. 
Judges 8.31, what's the significance of that? So if we go to uh, this line, Jotham's line, um, in 2013, so I have these this period of time here, but we also have yeah, Abimelech's birth, beginning a resumption of idolatry. Okay, I don't know if it's marking his birth, but this is when Gideon dies, they mention it, but... Um, so August 31st in uh, 2013, oops. so August 31st, 2013, so you're going to have, of course, that eight with August and so we're going to put it here, 831. <clears throat> so we have that period of time in 2012. And we have this October 5th, 2012, to December 21st, 2012. But we also have... August 31st, 2013. So I'm going to switch this around. Just to, uh... Okay, I have a strange question. Okay. Stephen, as, well, as I heard you say this, you were saying that <clears throat> Abimelech should be tied with the year 1260 BC, right? Yeah. Yet in tabled history, you're showing that Eli was born in 1285, which means 1260, Eli would have been 25 years old when Abimelech would have been there as a judge as well. How does that how does that fit? Well, this is a different part of Israel. I'm aware of that. I mean, I'm I'm also looking that in 1194 in tabled history you have this as Jephthah beginning to judge. Stephen? <clears throat> do you have Stephen, do you have an answer to Dwight? You're on the music. Um, um yeah, that's just what the numbers up or have been given, you know, just with the uh, statements on white right, and then you know so the way I had Eli was, was connected with the tabernacle being three hundred years. Right. So um you go three hundred years and then consider that was when Eli died at the end of that three hundred so you just count back and then um, so that, that's just the way it works out. You know, if you're going to take down years as it's like. Yeah, and, and so there's an overlap of this history, right? That's what you're saying? Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. So, um, so we end up with the 1260 um, in... Uh, in this line, right? So that's what we're saying. We have the 1260. And we're taking 831. But even though this is a different period of time, so even though we laid these out as, as a continuous line, they also are an overlap, right? That is, they're line upon line. That is, this history occurs prior to the fall of Abimelech. But this history, this line, like all lines, they can be laid over top of each other, right? 
And in 2013, on August 31st, we're going to have the midnight cry uh, first being calculated. Just because I have a knowledge of how the biblical calendar works, and Jeff didn't, and other people didn't know that. They thought each month is 30 days. So Jeff introduces this question on that day. That's on the Sabbath, the last day of that camp meeting. He asked the question, and I do the calculation. So uh, I calculate which day is the first day of the first month, being April 19th, and then the first day of the fifth month is going to be um, August 15th. Right? So I figure that on August 31st, 2013. Now, one of the things about that is the Mayan calendar, it's going to start on August 11th, 3113 BC. So we have here this 3113 in this August 31, 2013. So we have this tie with this Mayan calendar in symbols. So it's in August of 3113, technically August 11th, that the Mayan calendar begins. That's on the Gregorian calendar. It would be September 7th. 3114 BC on the Julian calendar, because the Gregorian calendar does have a zero year when you go back into the past. <clears throat> so we're going to have a Bimelech start there uh, when he's first mentioned. That's Judges 831. So this 831 symbol gives us August 31. Now, of course, it doesn't do that in uh, this history. We don't have an August 31 in 2019 that I know of that's a symbol, but we're just putting it there. So in Judges 831, we're going to say that's 1260 BC. Abimelech is going to be made king. And that's going to happen at when Gideon dies. <clears throat> okay. So we can put a verse there. Maybe I should put these as bolds to mark that that's the verse. Okay. So then um, going back to this line, um, we're going to have a formalization of the message. Right. And, and we're going to say that's in 2014. Now, we have lots of different events that happen in these years. Um, in 2014, of course, we have the camp meeting on June 22nd. And we know that Noel's going to present that. So what I had found before. And so we could just put that. We could put June 22. And then we would put um, uh, Ezra 7, 9. That is, is then presented. Now, do we have a verse in Judges that's going to help us establish that as a formalization? So in... In Judges chapter 8, we took 831, so that's when Abimelech is introduced. And then when we go to Judges 9, can we take a verse from here? Is there some symbol that we can attach to uh, the understanding of Ezra 7-9 on June 22nd, where that's going to be presented at that camp meeting? And that's a symbol for FFA, June 22nd. So the whole thing of Ezra 7-9 is it has to do with, for us at that time, understanding the first day of the fifth month. We're going to understand uh, something from 457 BC that connects to Millerite history. This, this really opens up 
our understanding of Millerite history. And, and so we have to also decide what this message is, right? So we know we have this darkness of time setting. We know we have a message that arrives. Now that message that arrives, you know, has to do with line upon line. Now we're going to have it formalized with this Ezra 7, 9. So we're going to have Abimelech. He's going to... Um, says here, commune with his mother's brethren, right? And with all the family of the house of his mother's father. And he's going to propose that um, they have him rule over them rather than the 70 sons of Gideon. Now, when we take in Jotham's line, remember, we're going back in this history, in the past, in this movement, that's going to then be applied in 2019. That is, it's going to counteract the message of Parminder. But at the time that this is being discovered, we're not actually aware that any of this information that we're discovering is counteracting Parminder's message, right? So Jotham's line is this parable going back to this history showing the fall of Abimelech, right? So this is a rather complicated, complicated line because even though I did draw them out um, that they run uh, in this one after the other, to illustrate it this way. Uh, in reality, they really lay on top of each other. That is, this is counteracting this. So these two things go together. These two lines really go on top of each other, like we have it here. But we're trying to address um, each line separately first. Then we'll see how they lie on top of each other. So we know that if we have a formalization here on June 22nd, we're going to take that as this formalization in this particular line. Um, and that's because the message that arrived had to do with Ezra 7 9, right? So there's something about what happened, what arrived on August 31st, 2013, even though we're marking the time of the end as this, and we could say that this is an increase of knowledge. We could have just say that that's, that's what's happening. We have this increase of knowledge in 2013. But the line starts with this failed prediction and this 77 days preceding it. So now we get to June 22nd, and we're looking at Ezra, or not Ezra, we're going to look at Judges chapter 9 and see how it connects to Ezra 7 9. Is there anything there that we can we can take? Because remember, we have to be able to show this uh, to others, right? We want this to be clear of, of how we're doing it. Okay. Now there was a strange thought that I had as we were talking about this with Abimelech. Okay. If we're placing this with Abimelech at 1260. Yeah. Of course, our symbol <clears throat> here of 1260 can also be related to the 42 months. It can be related to the 126. It can be related to the 2520, right? Yeah. <clears throat> now, my strange thought was to look at this because <clears throat> as you were asking 
how else can we look at this as a potential time of the end? Okay. In a time of the end, would you not have some type of a time of probation? Um, well, you have a, uh, I mean, you have a time prophecy that marks the time of the end, and then you have a period of time in which messages are given, the first and second message, and then you have a close of probation. Correct. Yeah. But just just like with the 2300 days, <clears throat> we have this 490 years that was accounted unto Daniel's people, right? The 70 weeks. Correct. I had looked at this where with the 1260, as Stephen was presenting it, if there was to be a time of probation, say 490 years, how would that work out? And it would bring us to 770 BC. So does that give an interrelation with the 77 that we are seeing you know, the 77 days, 77 whatever, in in all these other lines that we've been working with. Okay, so that's interesting. So you're saying that when we count from 1260 BC and we subtract 70 weeks, that is 490 years. Right. We get 770 BC, seven times seven. Right. Or ten, seven times 70, right, which is 70 weeks. It's the symbol of 70 weeks. Yes. And, and that's interesting just in and of itself as a calculation. I mean, even if we're not talking about these history, if we just say, if we subtract 490 years from 1260, we get 770, a symbol of 490. That's, that's interesting, right? Now, you're saying that in, in applying this to then uh, the time of the end, that's, I think, what we have in front of us right? as far as this line. So when we look at this line and we talk about here in, in Abimelech's downfall, and we go 1260, um, we can relate the 777 seven, seven to the 70 times 7, right? That's Lamech, sure. right? The two Lamechs? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So we have the 70 times, so 770 BC. So we, we can just put this calculation here, I guess. Um, so we go 1260 minus 490 equals 770, which equals 7 times 70. Okay. So that just gives us this uh, symbol, right? Correct. Okay. So that helps establish that. And we know, of course, um, we also have the 70 weeks gives us the 777. So I'm just going to put that there as well. So we can see Abimelech's downfall is symbolized here. Uh, and we can just put Lamech. Okay, so that um, so gives us a Bimelech and I'm just doing a calculation here.
Sorry about that. Just seeing how this works out. Okay. <clears throat> so it, uh, when it comes to Abimelech, I just wanted to look at the gematria of his name. Um, so uh, Abimelech's gematria is, uh, the, the normal sum isn't that interesting. It's 58. Well, that doesn't particularly mean anything to me. But if we take the product, just like we would with Lamech, where we take the gematria and we multiply and we get this uh, 187200, right? 187200. If we do that with the Bimelex name, we get a, a number which is 1,684,800. And this, if we took this number um, and uh, we would divide it by 360, that's what I did, uh, we would get um, uh, 4680, so 4680. And that number, if it's divided by 12, gives us 390. So um, it gives us that 390 year prophecy. So whether that means anything or not, that's, that's what I was doing. I was just doing this calculation. Um, and something about that number, but I can't remember what it is. Well, I know what the 468 is. That's the, um, the number of years between uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and 538, the start of the 1260. That's what that number is. So whether it relates to that or not, I don't know. But that is, it would be uh, 4,680 prophetic years if we took the gematria and multiplied it, the product. And, and that would be 10 times the number of years from 70 AD to 538. So that seems kind of significant in relation to the 1260. People follow what I'm doing there. Yeah, so we're meaning seven times 70 symbolically. Yeah, in that, uh, so we're taking that as a symbolic 770. So 1260 minus 490 gives you 770, which symbolically represents the 70 times 7 curse of Lamech, Lamech, the descendant of Cain. And we know that there's a relationship between that 770 and the Lamech who lived 777 years. So there's two different Lamechs. One gives you 77, 70 times 70, and the other gives you 777 because of the length that he lived. So, so that gives us this symbol here for uh, marking this time of the end as also the 490, right? And, and we have two different um, prophecies that start in uh, 457 BC. We have the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. So they're all, all tied together. And we're tying together here 457 BC uh, to Millerite history, right? So the 70 weeks begin. That's what uh, this Ezra 7-9 that's discovered uh, the date of the midnight cry. It's tying Millerite history to the history of 457 BC. 
This was the insight that God gave um, Emiliano, right? That there was this connection. Now it was already understood in Millerite history to some degree, in the sense that there, that they looked at Ezra seven and they understood uh, the journey. What they hadn't done is connected it to their history. They didn't look at the first day of the fifth month or the first day of the first month in this way as a line. And so we had this insight. So Ezra 7, 9 is the insight that allows us uh, to do all of the things that we did. It introduces the symbolic use of dates. So we started looking at the, all the first days of the fifth month. Right. And so all of these things happen there. But we're, we're, now we're placing this at November 9th because what we have in Abimelech's downfall is the application of the light that came prior to November 9th. Right. So we have all of this light that's coming prior to. Tess's prediction, Parminder and Tess's time setting. And all of this light is going to undo or counteract what Parminder is trying to do. So we have, in a sense, a great controversy being waged with Satan's darkness. And we have this in every line, but with the light that God is giving. But he's going to give this light prior to Abimelech's downfall but they can be laid upon top of each other. So obviously they occur his, historically. These way marks are going to precede November 9th, but they also lay on top of it, right? So that there's, uh, it's going to be undone by Jotham's line. So we have Ezra 7, 9, that becomes in Jotham's line, uh, this um, formalization of the message, right? And then in 2015, um, and oh, and the verse that we're going to use here is in Judges, Judges chapter nine. And so this is pretty important. And it's going to be, um, they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons, which followed him. So here we have this, the house of Baal Bareth. So this is, what kind of house is this? Is this a temple? Is this just the name of a person? And we also have that symbol, 11-7. There with Baal Bereth, Baal Bereth. So is this a, a false temple, a counterfeit sanctuary, or is this just the name of some person? If we take a look at Judges 8.33, I think you'll have a, uh, a good example and you'll have a good explanation. Right. So in Judges 8.33, came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went whoring after Balaam and made Baal beareth their God. Right. So we're going to see this is not just some guy's house, that this is a temple for Baal beareth. Right. So you're Correct. going to have this God of the covenant or, or Lord of the covenant. Um, concerning numbers, number 58, Eli was 58 years old when he began to judge. Okay, so, uh, so if we take, that is the number of Abimelech, we just have the gematria is 58. So Stephen's commenting on that. Um, <laughs> So we have this Baal Bareth that's mentioned. Okay. 
and and it's their god right well okay and then when we look at the name meaning the lord of the co of the covenant right yeah so it's a counterfeit now, does the Hebrew number have anything to do with what we're talking about? Well, it's just if we take 11 times 17, we get 187, right? And so when we see this 11 and 7 together, we know 11 times 7 is 77. So it symbolizes that. We know that the 777 days is 1100 uh, or 111 weeks, right? So we've seen this 11 and 7 together before. Here it adds a zero with it, but there is the, the Hebrew number 11, 7. Okay, but if you, if you multiply 11 and 70 together, what do you get? Well, you'd get uh, 770. Right. Right. So yeah, so we have that, all of those numbers, the, the July 18 symbol, the 770, and um, 77 as well, but if you just divide. Okay, so here we have this Baal Bareth. Um, so all these symbols that we've talked about, they're here. Right. Okay. And uh, then when we look at nine verse four, this is where they're going to take the 70 pieces of silver out of the house of their God, Baal Bareth. And they're going to hire vain and light persons, right? So, so we can see here that this is a formalization of this message. At least that's where I'm going to place it. <clears throat> that is, I take 9 verse 4 as, as connecting to Ezra 7.9. That is that whole st story of Ezra coming from Babylon and going to Jerusalem. And remember, they're going to have this gold and silver that's going to be given. And it's going to be divided among um, the priests. And when they travel to Jerusalem, when they get there, they're going to wait three days. And then on the fourth day, they're going to go into uh, the temple and deliver this gold and silver into God's house. But here they're taking silver. 70 pieces of silver out of the house of their God to pay these people to commit murder. So this is again, a counterfeit. So these symbols that we see here in, in this story, these are truths that are exposing Parminder's message. That's how I would understand it. All right. Now, if we are looking further at this definition of the vain men, okay. vain and light persons. Vain and light persons, yeah. Is the Hebrew to be understood that that is describing worthless and dissolute men? Persons who are living on the public and had nothing to lose? Um, well, okay, you bring up living on the public. It, well, I don't know. I'm using what I'm what I'm doing here. When I set up my eSword, I did not use a lot of commentaries. I, I have this one that comes up called the TSK cross reference. Yeah, that's the treasury of scripture knowledge. That's basically the notes from the, the King James translators. Okay. And that's the note that was being made about this particular phrase. Okay. So they just say persons living on the public and had nothing to lose. Okay. I just don't know what living on the public means. That That's not an expression I'm familiar with. Well, okay. Years ago, <clears throat> those that refused to get a job or were not looking or willing to seek for employment were said to be living on the public dole. <clears throat> here's, oh, okay. a, here, here's a situation where in this definition, 
that you have worthless and dissolute men, they have nothing to lose. Now, at this point, that would mean having nothing to lose, that they had nothing really invested, nothing that that they really cared about. And when I'm looking at a situation like this, remembering how it was with Parminder and Tess, the ones that were going to have everything to lose were those of us that were willing to study and especially what Elder Jeff had established. Okay, so this is this is just representing people who are not willing to study the Bible for themselves. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, I mean, it, it's definitely fr frivolous too. I mean, I mean, this isn't really about necessarily people. This is about a message that people have, right? And because we're not saying that there's, you know, 70 people or there's people that were hired to uh, uh, kill these 70 sons particularly. But this is about a doctrine or a teaching that undoes um, the teachings of the Bible. And, and so this is a doctrine that comes from Protestantism. So Biblack hires this, and this is the whole attitude of somebody studying for you instead of you studying for yourself, that you're going to watch videos at double speed or whatever, and you're just going to accept what the teachers tell you because you can't study for yourself because God can't teach you individually, right? Or... Or as I have run into with other pastors, that they are trained in Greek and Hebrew, and that their training is necessary for us to be able to understand what the how the Bible is written, and so we need an interpreter. Yeah, and this is what Parminder was saying: is he was it wasn't necessarily Greek and Hebrew; he was saying that it's methodology. And you can't understand the methodology unless you've been trained by proper teachers. Exactly. And that, and that since you're not trained, that you have to accept what we tell you. I mean, to me, that was just utterly insane. You know, for a Seventh-day Adventist to accept that argument as having any validity. But... Where is that attitude derived from? Well, it's derived from, you know, the Catholic Church, ultimately. Thank you. Satan. But Protestants adopted it, right? And even this movement adopted it. Right? And, and before Parminder, I mean, I mean, Parminder was there. They set up this doctrinal, doctrinal analysis group. I mean... I mean, I know they put me on that group. Uh, the only thing that I would do in when I read a paper and I'd comment on, you know, grammar and things like that. But I didn't think that we should have a group um, deciding whether something's true or not so that it can be published. And, and the idea here was, well, we set up this group so that when stuff was published in um, uh, future news, you know, that, that it had been read by somebody other than just Jeff before it was published. Because in the past, Jeff would decide what he's going to publish and not publish, um, which is fine. It's his, his paper, he could decide what he wants to do. And, and really, anybody can do that. You have a Facebook page, you can decide whether you want something published on your Facebook page. It's not papalism just because you say, well, this is a bunch of nonsense. I'm not going to post it on my Facebook page. I'm not going to approve the post. But when you have a group of men set up to decide whether anything can be shared in the movement. So initially they set it up this way. 
you know, that it was just about a publishing, they then applied it to your personal Facebook page. That is, Tabo said, you can't promote anything about July 18th on your personal Facebook page because it hasn't been approved by the doctrinal analysis group. If you want to publish it on your personal Facebook page, you have to submit it to the doctrinal and analysis group. And if they approve of it, then you can put it on your Facebook page. And, and that's exactly what the church did with the 2520. Right? You're being kind. Yeah. So, so, so this movement made that same error. The fact that we could even allow that doctrinal analysis group, uh, I think, was appalling. But it became definitely much more obvious with Parminder's question and answer period, answer period after August 29th, um, 2019, where he answered that question, you know, Basically, are we allowed to think for ourselves? And Parminder says, no. You can't think for yourself, right? So, so this is the situation um, that's going to arise in the movement. Um, but we're saying in counteract, so we, we have this on a line. So part of the problem that we have, so if we look at our lines again, that we're trying to sort out, so I'm going to put this here on this line, Judges 9, verse 4, where he's going to hire these, he's going to take this gold and, or this silver, 70 pieces of it, and hire these vain and light persons. And I'm saying, well, this is June 22nd, Ezra 7, 9, uh, being expounded upon. And we're going to use 9, verse 4 to do that. Because 9 verse 4 is going to talk about the 70 pieces of silver. And in the story of Ezra, you're going to have this gold and silver that's going to be given. And it's going to be um, brought to the house of God in Jerusalem. right? So this is a reverse of that. But I'm saying this is Jotham's line. Right now, I, I could say, well, and, and that's where we have to distinguish is we have Jotham's line and we have this line, Abimelech's line. Now, they're related to each other because Jotham is going to give a parable. So, you know, maybe I should just say, well, this is. This actually goes on. This line, right, I could just take this and put this here. Right, say here is Abimelech's line. We put the same way marks on this line that we do on the other line, even though in, in Abimelech's line, it's not going to be June 22nd. Right? That's all. We're, we're going to say, though, that because uh, there's going to be a date here, and we don't know what that date is yet. But we have November 9th, 2019. And then we're going to have a date here on this line. And then we're going to have an empowerment. There's going to be a date there. And then there's going to be a second. And we haven't decided what those dates are yet um, for that line. Now, we have here, we put April 26th. So whether this is correct or not. And I'm not sure, do we just take that line and make them the same? Or do we have this line different? That is, can we distinguish as Jotham's line like this in one way, but yet when we lay it out like this, we have different dates? That's what I don't know yet. This line here, whether they're identical to the, just taking these two lines and putting them together. But if we did do that, if we're going to take this line, what we had was April 26th, but that was just a symbolic date. <clears throat> and the way that we had drawn this line out, um, we had April 26, 2020. And I don't know if we all remember exactly how we did this. 
but this is the date we had and we I don't I don't know if I remember right now but that's what we had here right so we're going to have to sort this out um what was april 26 2020 I believe it was a study that was done <clears throat> So that when when you send an email to Jeff re regarding the seven eighteen. Oh um, yeah, that's going to be April twenty sixth, uh, twenty twenty. You're right. So that's what that is. April twenty sixth, twenty twenty. Um, yeah, I'm going to send a letter, e an email to Jeff. Okay. Uh, about the failed prediction. Okay. Thanks. I knew. It. Because I know I have April 26th uh, as symbolic dates sometimes. Okay, so if we're going to say this April 26, 2020, we're going to put it in this line. Um, can we relate this to Ezra 7 9 as the formalization of the message? And 9 verse 4, so the 70. Yeah, so we're going to talk about this failed prediction, right? And this is going to relate to the Mayan calendar, right? That is, we're going to have this July uh, 10th date. So we're going to have July 10th. That's the next date we have. And then whatever verses we're going to have here for this. So if we're going to take April 26th, we know that, that the symbol there is the 26th day of the fourth month. And we don't get that from Ezra 7, 9. So, but we still can take, so in this line, in Abimelech's downfall, we're not looking at Ezra 7, 9 as this nine verse four and but we're still taking judges nine verse four right the nine verse four is the high hiring of these 70 vain persons or these vain per, vain and light persons they're getting 70 pieces of silver whether they're each getting one piece of silver it doesn't really say so uh, it's an assumption to say that there's 70 of them but there's these vain and light persons that are going to be hired and they're going to be paid 70 pieces of silver. Just doesn't say how much each one of them gets to do this. So if we're going to put the April 26th date there in Abimelech's downfall, that is, I'm going to send to Jeff an email so this is email, uh, failed prediction. Right. That's the, that's what the email is about. So we get this failed prediction email. And the, is there something in this verse that addresses that? Okay, so um, Angela says 70 pieces of silver are the counterfeit of FFA uh, being given $165,000 to start the School of the Prophets. Now, um, 
Now this $165,000 that brings up a question is what is the symbol of that? I mean, he gets $165,000. That's what Jeff tells us that he gets. Um, Doesn't he make more of the date he received this? Than... Right. Well, he makes more of the date, right? The date is June 22nd, 2011, right? And then he just says three years later to the day on June 22nd, they're going to have that school of the prophets um, or the camp meeting there, right? After they have the, this school of the prophets. So it's the first camp meeting at the school of the prophets, not at the location at the, the land, but they have the school of the prophets. They've had their students um, that year and they're going to have that camp meeting. So he just says, you know, and it's connected. So that camp meeting is connected. It's put on by the students, right? So you're going to have Tyler, Brittany, and Michael presenting in 2014. Uh, they're involved in organizing that, right? So they have a part to play in that. Um, right, so, so that's what happens in uh, 2014, why it's connected. So June 22nd, we have this symbolic date, right? It's also a date in Millerite history when it's Pentecost in Millerite history, when Samuel Snow writes his third letter. <clears throat> but the $165,000, um, how does that relate as a symbol? Um, when you take that number, the only significant number really that comes out of that, if you look at the divisors, is 264. So you get this um, 26 day of the fourth month symbol. So that, I mean, simply, I guess, the way that you would look at this, because we're looking at two different lines, Abimelech's and Jotham's. And, and we're really trying to address Jotham's line primarily, but we haven't even looked at the symbols in all of that yet. Um, so in Jotham's line, we put this June 22nd date with, with the Ezra 7-9. But the June 22nd, you get $165,000, which has a divisor of 264. And that is, it's 625 times 264 equals 165,000. <clears> so I don't know what 625 means. Okay, so, you know, we're trying to figure out some of these, these symbols here. So there's lots of, lots of ideas. Yeah, so 526 backwards. Yeah, I know, 620. So what's 526 other than my uh, part of the password to get into this view? Because it's uh, 526853. It's also my apartment number here. 
But um, I mean, the only thing I can say is if you multiply 624 by uh, 264, there's if you take the reverse, you get a 264 less if you subtract the two. But I don't know. I don't know what that means. That just seems kind of... Uh, Okay, but 625 added to 152 gives you 777. Okay. Um, okay. 152 reversed is 251. Does that help us in any way? Not really. No, okay. it, 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 it's starting to get just too outside we're doing too much outside the lines here to try to figure this out all we can say here is when we look at this um so we got jotham's jotham's line we got this june 22nd but here we're going to have april 26th right we have the email um which i don't know why i need that bold so we have this email, which is connected to this failed prediction, right? That is, I tell Jeff about this on April 26. So the symbol there is 264, right? So in this other one, we're dealing with the June 22nd date. Now, it's going to be three years after he receives $165,000. Um, so whether we want to look at that symbol there, I, I've tried to look at the $165,000 symbol. It's never really gotten me anywhere other than that, you know, we can see it's 264 times uh, 625, right? Whatever that means. But here we have this April 26, this email, and we're looking at this same verse. That is, we're going to use the same verse here um, as this formalization of this message. Now, we're putting this on Jotham's line, but Jotham doesn't start prophesying until after he's being made king, right? That he's going to give this prophecy about the downfall of Abimelech. <clears throat> so, so we have to understand try to figure out how we're doing this why we're doing it this way but part of the reason is we're saying that his parable relates to this history of the development of this understanding um so in abimelech's downfall i mean these are events that happen in abimelech's history but <laughs> I know it's confusing because we now have uh, this line that that precedes Abimelech's downfall. And we're saying that the information that's given here has to do with the information at this camp meeting, right? So we're going to, in 2024, we're going to go to this camp meeting. So we got Jotham's line. And Jotham's line is going to give us June 22nd but it's going to line up with an event on April 26th. That is, both of these are the formalization. That is, we would put the one over top of the other. And, and so the question is, how do we connect Ezra 7-9 and what happens here in 2014, or do we do it this way, that we say that that relates to this calculation of this failed prediction that I sent to Jeff on April 26th regarding the Mayan calendar. Now we can see in this history, this starts with the Mayan calendar, right? That's what, that's what we're calling the time of the end. And then on June 22nd, we're gonna have this information. And, and, and in this year, we're gonna figure out, you know, the midnight cry. But here in this, in, in the next year, we have 
it's not my presentation, this is going to be Noel's. But it's going to be about Ezra 7 9. And we're saying that this is going to line up with this. So the question is, what is the connection between the understanding of Ezra 7 9? Other than we have the symbolic use of dates. And maybe that's partly why we can come to this conclusion that's sent to Jeff. Maybe that's just simply all of it it is. Right? So Abimelech's downfall is going to happen as a result of an understanding that is developing in the history preceding November 9th. Right? So in this history, we're saying that we have this failed prediction that's going to start Jotham's line. And, and part of that is going to be this understanding of Ezra 7, 9. So we're going to have 831 marked here. And Ezra 7, 9 is going to be marked in Judges 9, 4 as this formalization. But here it's going to be about the failed prediction on the line before it, right? So it's almost like you would want to put this here, but but you can't because this is the history that precedes 11.9, right? So <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying? Without the understanding of Ezra 7.9, we don't have, one is we don't have any of this information that uh, any of this history that we call Abimelech's downfall. So we're going to have the failed prediction, and then this is going to be empowered with this July 10th date. That's what we're saying. J July 10th date is just this combination of um, the Mayan calendar with Revelation 9. It's going to give us July 10th, this 10th day of the seventh month as this empowerment. So whether this is correct or not, that's what we have to decide. Is this the best way to do these lines? So we've done them and we agreed that this made sense before, but now as we try to apply these verses, can we just do this? <clears throat> and when we look at a Jotham's line here, so we know when we have Joseph's line and we look at 2015, we're going to say that this is um, going to be the camp meeting in Alberta where I present the 26th day of the fourth month, right? So maybe this, this should be changed a little bit. You would think the 26th day of the fourth month should line up here as this empowerment. But we didn't do the line that way. So maybe we need to. Maybe we need to change how we're laying out Abimelech's line. So we're going to have to do some work on this. We're going to have to sort this out so that it makes sense. I'm not saying that we should move it. I'm just saying that that would make more sense if we're going to be lining these up. Because here, I'm going to come to understand the 26th day of the fourth month. But maybe that's how it should be. So this is going to be July 17th is the date that we're marking. And it's going to be uh, the 26th day of the fourth month. Right? And then we have to decide what verse that's going to be. Okay?
So that's where we're going to have to come to tomorrow. We're going to have to try to sort this out. I wish we could do this more quickly. Okay, so we went a bit over time. So let's uh, think about this over the next day. And we'll come back to this tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we had here to study. Uh, we pray that you can continue to teach us. And um, we pray for each person that your angels can watch over them. We ask for your presence in our lives throughout the day. Help us to cling to you. Uh, bless those watching these videos. Um, and we pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can speak to each person who seeks you in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.